<clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Faley, and I work on the virtualization team, <clears throat> primarily on uh, tooling part of the vert stack. <clears throat> Thanks for joining today. Um, next 45 minutes or so, I'll describe a journey that some old school virtualization hackers took to running virtual machines and containers on Kubernetes. Um, we had really no knowledge of Kubernetes and little container experience. So we often felt we were climbing a mountain and really didn't have much more than some hiking experience. And that feeling is kind of channeled into this talk by describing the journey as a series of camps on our way <clears throat> to the summit of, of running VMs and containers. And so with that, a little word of caution. I mean, we're pretty green, the team on, on, uh, and noobs on Kubernetes. So there could be some inaccuracies in this talk. <laughs> Feel free to point those out. Um, and it also means I may not be able to answer some question immediately. You may have to take some notes and get back to you on that. <clears throat> um, yeah, so let's get into it. So why this journey? Um, Kubernetes has, uh, you know, experienced some really <clears throat> uh, rapid growth throughout the IT landscape. It's certainly no experience or no secret that SUSE uh, has embraced Kubernetes and, and containerization. And the merger of SUSE and Rancher actually are going to further propel us in the world of Kubernetes. Um, and as organizations roll this out, there's <clears throat> been a demand to run virtual machines um, on their Kubernetes clusters, uh, similar to containerized workloads using the same processes and, <clears throat> and uh, tools and processes that are used in container workloads. And SUSE PM, as far as I know, has also been uh, approached uh, with requests for this functionality, particularly since we exited the OpenStack project. Um, and with that in mind, <clears throat> the Vert team decided to take this fun journey and, and try to get VMs running on Kubernetes. Um, I was kind of a lead guide, so to speak, on this journey, but I had quite a few travelers that joined me, uh, Claudio Fontana, quite a bit of help, Olaf Herring, Dirk Mueller, Jaime Ruiz. I mean, there's quite a few folks that I could name. Um, <clears throat> And we started this journey, actually, we'll, we'll start at Basecamp, and we started looking at this problem during Hack Week 19, with uh, the ultimate goal was to run SLES virtual machines in a Kubernetes cluster based on SLES, and, uh, and preferably a SUSE Kubernetes product like CAS. So we started by exploring some ways that Kubernetes can be extended. We looked at open source projects providing uh, virtualization extensions to Kubernetes. And there's not many. Um, and some, like virtual kubelet, we've, we kind of quickly ruled out. I mean, on the surface, maybe it seemed like it was something interesting, but as we look closer, uh, we realized virtual kubelet, for example, replaces um, <clears throat> the kubelet on a Kubernetes cluster node was something that can be backed by uh, Azure Cloud, uh, Azure Container Images, or uh, Amazon AWS Fargate. So while these things are pretty interesting, they really didn't meet our goals. So our focus quickly shifted to Kubert and uh, a project called Vertlet. Before getting too far into Kubernetes and, and Vertlet and Kubevert. Um, just wanted to bring out a few terms for people who maybe not be into, or so knowledgeable on Kubernetes. Um, <clears throat> resource is a Kubernetes term that refers to an endpoint in the Kubernetes API server that stores some collection of API objects. Uh, for example, there's a pod resource that stores a collection of pod objects. And a pod is a Kubernetes term uh, that represents kind of the smallest unit of work that Kubernetes will schedule. And I think that pretty much any Kubernetes resource that performs work will eventually have a life as a pod. Uh, pods have their own namespaces. They can have multiple containers, actually. Um, and within the pod, the containers have their own namespace, but they 
have different PID and mount name spaces, as well as C groups uh, for resource control. And pods generally have some entry point that um, you know, it's the service to be run that provide the functionality to pod. For example, something like, you know, user bin, uh, my favorite time server. A pod spec is just a YAML or JSON description of a pod resource. A manifest is a term that I use. I've seen it elsewhere in Kubernetes documentation as well. A kind of a generic term for a pod spec for any Kubernetes resource. And a kubelet is the Kubernetes node agent. Its primary purpose is to ensure that the containers described in a pod spec are, are running and healthy on, on a node. <clears throat> so Kubernetes is a huge project, and I certainly won't pretend to know much about the thing, but we did need to know a little bit about its extension points so we could understand how uh, projects like Vertlet and, and Kubert went about extending the thing. Uh, and it can be extended at several points, uh, all the way from a client uh, cube control program uh, via plugins, all the way down to uh, the Kubelet service running on, <clears throat> on the individual nodes. Um, <clears throat> Cube control plugins, obviously, since it's the client that runs on a user's uh, workstation, they they don't have any effect on cluster-wide policies or site-wide policies. Um, the scheduler certainly would plugins for it, but we didn't investigate that and really don't have any other info on it. Uh, but cube control or, or um, the kubelet also provides uh, extension points. And then really the most interesting one is the API server. Uh, it seems like most it's most widely used extension point for Kubernetes. And in fact, much of Kubernetes uh, behavior is implemented by extending the API with custom resources and custom controllers. So we need to take a look at those a little bit closer. <clears throat> <clears throat> so custom resources are created uh, using a resource called a custom resource definition, uh, which certainly has to be a built-in resource. Otherwise, you know, we're kind of a chicken and egg uh, type scenario. Um, <clears throat> and the CRD provides things like the name of the custom resource and the API group that will um, serve the custom resources and then any API versions that the custom resource supports. Um, <clears throat> and when we create one of these things, a custom resource definition, a new endpoint is created in the Kubernetes API server, which then can be used to CRUD objects of this new resource type. Um, the default controller for <clears throat> Uh, custom resources provided by Kubernetes just simply stores and retrieves data in the Kubernetes database, which is this thing called etcd. <clears throat> and <clears throat> if we use a custom controller in place of this default uh, custom resource contr definition controller that Kubernetes provides, we can extend the Kubernetes API with really an application-specific declarative API. Uh, custom controllers provide control loops that try to maintain <clears throat> the, the cluster state with the, the state declared by the user. Another common um, Kubernetes pattern are operators. Uh, this is a pattern that's kind of used to encode human knowledge required to deploy and run and, and maintain an application. Um, they're implemented using a deployment resource <clears throat> and are often used to manage custom resources and custom controllers that together, you know, provide some more complex Kubernetes application, like uh, Kubert, for example. <clears throat> so our first stop, after understanding a little bit about um, Kubernetes and how to extend it, was at Camp Vertlet. Um, Vertlet's a Mirantis <clears throat> sponsored project that essentially transforms a Kubernetes node from one that runs containers to one that runs virtual machines. Um, 
And Verlet enables virtualization by replacing the container runtime with one that's kind of tailored for virtualization. And <clears throat> with this approach, any Kubernetes node is running Verlet and is in effect restricted to running virtual machines. Uh, Marantis does provide a CRI proxy <clears throat> that can forward container um, runtime RPCs to Vertlet or a Docker shim, uh, but I'm not really familiar so much with the layering that can be done here. And if the shuffling of the container runtime stack has any effect on runtimes that we're interested in, like Creo, which is you know a runtime that we support at SUSE. <clears throat> So this is a diagram of the Verlet architecture, uh, courtesy of the Verlet architecture doc on GitHub. Um, we already mentioned that Kubelet provides some extension points in the Kubernetes stack. And one of them is the interface here between uh, the Kubelet and the container runtime. <clears throat> Kubernetes provides a container runtime interface API, CRI API, that allows use of any um, CRI compliant runtime. And the vertlet process and this vert proxy process here <clears throat> make use of this API to provide a new virtualization friendly runtime. Um, <clears throat> and the vertlet process can be used directly by the kubelet, or as we said, we can use the CRI proxy, which in theory allows multiplexing container and virtualized workloads on the same um, <clears throat> on the same node. But we we never got around to trying this in practice. Um, yeah, maybe I have another. Actually, I should comment here about kind of how. Uh, the deployment of VM works in, in, in Vertlet. Uh, so VM is represented as a pod resource in Vertlet. There's no special custom resource for that. Uh, and the VM definition is kind of embedded down in the spec section of the pod resource. And so when you create one of these things, uh, eventually it ends up uh, at the kubelet service on one of the nodes in a cluster. Uh, that would be forwarded to Vert proxy. <clears throat> which um, then it, it does a few things actually. Vert proxy has to get that uh, spec out of the, the VM spec out of the pod spec, convert that to live vert domain XML, and then um, sends that to a single lib vert D process running on the node that will essentially end up launching the VM. It does that through a vert wrapper which um, allows to do things like, you know, configure networking via CNI on the node if needed, get a tap FD, for example, to provide networking in the pod or in the VM. Um, and then once that process is done, anything Vert Wrapper needs to do, it actually then invokes the, uh, the QMU process and run the VM in there. So some hazards we've discovered along this route, or at least uh, thought about along this route, was uh, one, modifying the container runtime, which is certainly a pretty important component in the Kubernetes stack, seemed like a dubious proposition at best. I mean, um, as I said, it, effect on our runtime, Creo, is, is not known, and, and really just seems kind of dangerous to be fiddling with the runtime the way that Vertlet does. And I didn't really like the idea of no explicit VM resource either, which you know kind of prevents from defining some structure to the resource and being able to check the validity of the thing up higher in the stack. Um, <clears throat> and not a lot of features in Vertlet, uh, quite immature. Um, what VM attributes are supported are quite minimal and operations quite minimal. Um, so a pretty immature product and actually our, our project and, and actually has become pretty stagnant. Uh, the last release was in May of 2019. We're coming up on a year since the last commit. Um, 
So for these reasons, our stay at Camp Vertlet was really pretty short-lived. <clears throat> so the journey's next stop was at Kubevert, which is a Red Hat-sponsored project that extends Kubernetes by adding <clears throat> additional virtualization resource types through the Kubernetes Custom Resource Definitions API. And along with those custom resources, it provides custom controllers to, uh, to provide the virtualization logic for the cluster. And using this approach, the VM resources can be managed like any other uh, Kubernetes resource. I mean, I guess the same can be said for Vertlet, actually, since pods are just a, um, you know, a typical um, widely used Kubernetes resource. Um, but again, Qvert provides the advantage of <clears throat> expressing uh, a VM resource explicitly in the form of the VM uh, custom resource. And uh, instead of trying to shoehorn all the VM component or VM attributes into a pod spec. <clears throat> So this is a diagram of the Kubevert uh, architecture, courtesy of the architecture doc on GitHub project. <clears throat> we should talk about these components uh, quickly. Vert API uh, is the entry point for managing all Kubevert resources. It, it serves the Kubevert.io API group. <clears throat> It also validates uh, Kubert custom resources at the API server level before any processing is done by the cluster. Vert controller, like Vert API, is a cluster component that watches for new Kubert objects or updates to existing ones and takes some action. Uh, for example, if you're creating a new VM, Vert uh, controller would recognize the creation of this and then have to do some uh, cluster operations such as creating a pod to run the VM in and so on. <clears throat> Vert uh, handler is a daemon set and it's a node component. And its primary job is to keep the VMI spec uh, synced with the actual libvirt domain running in vert launcher. And vert launcher is, is the component that's actually responsible for running libvirt and QMU that provides the virtual machine environment. It's, it's just a lowly pod. <clears throat> so, in that architecture diagram, we, we kind of classify things cluster scope or node scope. They can also be uh, classified as trusted or untrusted. Trusted components are those that only run Qvert code, no third party code. And untrusted is everything else. Vert launcher is untrusted since it runs third party code, uh, the VM. And all other components are trusted, but it doesn't mean they have free reign of the cluster. The components only have access to the APIs and resources that they need. Uh, for example, I already mentioned Vert Handler needs cluster access uh, to VMI resources uh, to update their state and to orchestrate lifecycle changes. But it doesn't need access to do any pod operations. So it doesn't need to create or delete pods. So it has no access to the API group providing pod operations. One notable item from that architecture diagram also is that there's one libvert daemon per VM, uh, which, you know, if that sounds like a little bit overkill, uh, you're right. There's some work in upstream libvert actually. Uh, been going on for quite some time, slowly progressing to make libvert a little more friendly in environments like kubevert and Kubernetes. Also not shown on uh, the architecture diagram is a component called vert operator. And vert operator, along with the kubevert custom resource, implements um, a Kubernetes operator pattern, which we already mentioned. And it contains all the logic uh, to maintain and deploy and maintain the Kubert application on Kubernetes. So Red Hat is uh, aggressively developing Kubert. Uh, it's a sizable community. 
There's a pound virtualization channel on the Kubernetes Slack server. There's a Google group for uh, more traditional email communication. <clears throat> And of course, there's the GitHub ecosystem of collaboration. There's also a weekly community meeting, which I've yet to join. Um, pretty aggressive release cycle. Right now, there's monthly releases. <clears throat> and uh, to us, I mean, Kubert really extended Kubernetes uh, in, a, in a natural way, providing using the facilities it provides. And so even though we're kind of green with Kubernetes, it really seemed like the way to go. And to us, really, the only hazards along the route of Qbert was an awful lot to learn. <clears throat> so with some knowledge of Kubernetes and a little more understanding of how uh, Qbert fits into the picture, we decided, all right, it's time to paint this thing green. And our goal here was to build all the Qbert components using OpenSUSE or SLEE-based tooling and dependency, and then use the artifacts from that build to build containers from OpenSUSE or SLEE bases. Um, Qvert uses Bazel uh, for the build and test tool. I, I, I suppose Make and Maven and Mason and Gradle weren't cool enough, so they had to use some other one, uh, but it is, you know, I have found that the build language is pretty intuitive and it's easy enough to learn. <clears throat> but at least for the Kubevert project, um, where there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> Bazel plugins and Go modules and so on fetched from the network at build time, um, really just makes it not so well suited for offline builds, such as we have to do in the build service. And, you know, since we're building stuff for Kubernetes, now why not throw in some more layer of complexity and build the code in a damn container, especially crafted one. Uh, the standard upstream mate target <clears throat> uses a Fedora-based builder image for building the code. The image is downloaded from Docker Hub if needed. A persistent Docker volume is created for our syncing the code into the container and getting the build artifacts out of there after the build. Um, and the container spun up, <clears throat> this builder container, and the entry point is a set of commands to build all the components uh, and the related containers. And also part of the build um, <clears throat> is producing some manifests that um, are used to deploy Kubert to Kubernetes cluster. <clears throat> so how do I handle all the stuff downstream, uh, particularly the, with the build service and the need for offline builds? Um, and this builder didn't contain everything that's needed to build since even doing builds with the builder, we found that you know we're downloading Bazel plugins, Go modules, and so on. So it doesn't contain everything. Uh, that's needed and <clears throat> and seemed like a cool approach for maybe some upstream online CI platforms, but I really couldn't find a good use for this thing downstream. Uh, nonetheless, we did spend some time creating a builder image based off of OpenSUSE Leap 15.2, and we used that to successfully build all the Kubebird code. Uh, but we haven't really done anything with that. There's been no attempt to merge a thing upstream, which was really low priority work, in my opinion. <clears throat> we also explored enabling offline building in Bazel. Um, Bazel supports some offline mode where it uses a previously assembled tarball of all the dependencies. Uh, Dirk Mueller actually looked at this and uh, during the process of working on this, I mean, the tarball was growing to some whopping size. I think it was up to about 10 gig before we're like, we, we need to find some other route here. And one of those routes um, I discovered by looking at some of the helper scripts and the build helper scripts in the project and happened to find one that um, provided a helper to build the Go, co the Go components directly, which allowed us to... Uh, bypass Bazel altogether. <clears throat> so this looked like a pretty promising route, actually. 
And of course, along with building the code, we then need to build the containers. Um, and as many of you know, the build service supports building container images uh, and supports two ways to do so, Kiwi and, and Docker files. Um, <clears throat> Kiwi is certainly much more used uh, throughout SUSE, but all the container related builds around Kubert are done with Docker builds and Docker files. And so to avoid diverging too far from upstream, we, we really had a strong desire to stick with Docker builds for building the container images. But the path of this is, was not without hazards. Um, Kiwi enjoys, as I said, much better support and integration with the build service than, than Docker builds. The Docker builds do work, but functionality like dynamic versions, tags, build times, and so on were missing. Uh, but as luck has it, um, the SUSE private registry folks had went down this path just before us uh, and tried to fill some of these gaps. Uh, the Kiwi Mato Info, <clears throat> Mato Info Helper uh, source service was augmented uh, to allow passing things like package version and release down to the Docker build. Uh, so those would be available. Um, and Docker labels, which are things like a title for the container, the version, build time. Um, these things are often, uh, are, are these things are supported in Kiwi, but not in Docker builds. Uh, but like has it, uh, Fabian Voigt created a Docker label helper service that uh, substitute variables and the labels just before doing the Docker build so that you have access to things like build time and so on. And we can properly set these in labels in a label when building the container. One other problem that we have not solved yet is passing build args down to the Docker build. And we'd like to be able to do this so we can dynamically select an appropriate base for the container. So for example, if building the container against factory, we would want the container base to be tumbleweed. If building that same code against slice 15 SP2, we would want the container base to be slice 15 SP2. Uh, and Docker supports this, but the build service doesn't have any way of, for us to define um, these build args and something like the project config and then you know, passing them down into the actual Docker build. Uh, so it's an item on the to-do list. So our strategy for painting Kubert green was to build a code directory using these uh, helper scripts within the project so we could avoid Bazel. We would use Docker files <clears throat> for container builds and help close the Kiwi versus Docker file gap in a build service if necessary. Uh, which is a good thing. I mean, we really need to have this gap closed, in my opinion. I mean, we're going to have a bunch of rancher folks joining soon, and they're going to be familiar with Docker, but not so much with Kiwi. And then for the container builds, um, <clears throat> um, we actually created a package for each Kubert container, and there's five of them, if uh, we were counting earlier. Um, <clears throat> And initially, we added the full Kubert tarball into this uh, each container package. And then inside of there, we used Docker uh, multi-stage builds to build the container. So for example, in the first stage of building Vert API, we would build the Go code that uh, comprises the Vert API component. And then in the second stage, we would take that built thing along with the base and install it and set the entry point to Vert API and poof, um, we have a container. <clears throat> um, this worked fine, but the problem was that you know, we've duplicated this tarball, same exact thing across five different packages. So uh, we switched to using a separate package. We created a Kubert package where we do all the building and then install the resulting uh, binaries into sub packages. And then those sub packages are used later uh, when building the containers. 
So the Kubernetes package and all the containers, uh, they're, they're in OBS and the virtualization project where we do development for all virtualization related components in OpenSUSE. Uh, and there's branches and IBS for the various SLE uh, products, which at the moment is just slice 15 SP2. Um, and actually that branch is tracking the factory package just via link pack since we haven't released anything yet. There's actually some ECOs to get this stuff released as a technical preview in Slice 15 SP2. It uh, just hasn't made its way through all the ECO machinery yet. The Kubert package is in factory, however, and it's also been accepted as SUSE SLE 15 SP2 updates. <clears throat> So digging a little deeper into the build process for building the Go code, we just invoke uh, you know, one of the helper scripts that's shown here. And under the covers, that invokes you know, the familiar Go build command and spits out um, you know, some binary. And as I said, we package those up into various sub packages. Uh, there's one sub package, Qbert vert control, uh, which is the only one that's kind of delivered as a traditional RPM package. Um, <clears throat> and it can be installed on any client machine uh, that has admin access to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, all other sub packages are only for use in building the container, just installing when building the container image and, and setting the entry point to you know, the appropriate binary. <clears throat> so once built, container images must be made available for use, uh, similar to, you know, traditional RPM packages, and the build service provides this for free. Um, Builds, uh, container builds from OBS are published to registry.opensusa.org and images built in IBS to registry.susa.de. Like traditional packages, container images for SLE must follow some more rigorous process, you know, documentation, QA, maintenance, etc. cetera. Uh, it's all, the process is actually documented at this uh, confluence link I have here. And <clears throat> Once the container images are blessed, they're mirrored to uh, registry.susa.com, where all of SUSE's blessed and supported container images can be found. <clears throat> uh, one side note, uh, while we were painting this thing green, we did get a few patches uh, pushed upstream. So there's a little bit of green and upstream cube vert, not much. We need to do a lot more. So now with the green cube bird in our hands, it was time uh, for the next step of the journey and, and deploy this thing to a Kubernetes cluster. And for a cluster, we used a few old blades in the Provo lab with SLES 15 SP2 installed and CAFs 4.5. And the steps to deploy cube are actually quite simple once <laughs> you have spent quite a bit of time learning something about the thing. Uh, first, we create a namespace uh, within the cluster for the components, <clears throat> then create the Kubert custom resource, which we've already said models the um, Kubert application. Then we deploy the operator to the cluster and give it permissions to do things like create pods and access various uh, Kubernetes APIs, etc. And finally, we create the Kubert custom resource, which triggers the operator to deploy the mess. <clears throat> so creating the namespace is quite simple. Uh, here's a little example of that. I mean, we just apply a manifest defining <clears throat> uh, a namespace resource and give it a name. Simple enough. Jim, yeah. can I interrupt? Um, <laughs> There is a, a question from the chat that I believe was di directed to you. I also remind the audience that if you have a webcam, you can pop it up and ask the question. I'm going to read it from uh, C. Lee. Will you support continuous version updates on Kubevirt images on registry.suse.de as Kubevirt releases? I do not see the Kubevirt images today in registry.suse.de. That is the question. 
So we haven't got to that point of the uh, process yet. I mentioned there's some official container release process. Part of that is, um, you know, we have our containers in a develop project somewhere where we're maintaining them and like typical packages and you submit it somewhere to be included in a product. Containers often get submitted to these continuous rebuild projects, which I don't know so much about yet. Um, and frankly, I'm hoping I don't have to deal with much on that side of the process. It seems to be more product and, and um, project manager type stuff. But um, ultimately, yes, <laughs> that is the goal. Um, and as I said, they should eventually be mirrored to registry.susa.com as well, which is where we'll really want you know customers of this stuff, users or customers using this stuff to be pulling images, uh, not registry.susa.de. So hopefully that answers the question. <clears throat> um, so we've created namespace. Um, so the next thing is to create the kubebird custom resource definition. And it's a little bit more interesting of a manifest. It creates a new custom res a new resource of kind custom resource definition. And it has a name. And the important things are this group, which provide a <clears throat> API group name, kubebird IO in this case, and then some versions of the API that we support. <clears throat> After applying this manifest, the user could CRUD uh, Qvert custom resource. Um, and like any of the, the Kubernetes resources, they can be accessed by plural name or singular and short name or long. So in this case, KV and Kubeverts and KVS and Kubeverts are all the same. They're all synonymous. <clears throat> so we've already mentioned our vert operator is a deployment resource. <clears throat> its manifest is quite large, actually. It certainly wouldn't fit on a slide. But I've included some of the interesting stuff here. Um, the operator should be deployed to the Qbert namespace. And since it's a deployment, which is a type of controller for a replica set, we say we want two replicas, so we want two instances of this thing running in the cluster. And then the spec section contains the actual command line to run in vert operator. And that thing includes stuff like the registry where the images of kubevert can be found and the SHA-256 sums. Uh, this allows the operator to fetch those things from the registry and deploy them to the cluster. The Kubert operator needs some additional permissions beyond that provided by the default pod service account. Uh, we already said it needs to do things like create pods to run the Kubert components. So the operator includes some role resources that define what API groups and resources that it has access to and what actions it, it can take on those resources. And this slide <clears throat> shows a small snippet of uh, the operator's <clears throat> role re resources with respect to uh, pods, essentially. So as we said, it needs to be able to create pods, the operator. And here we're <clears throat> saying we're going to give the operator access to these resources, service accounts, services, endpoints, pods, in this API group, which when not specified is the core API group of uh, Kubernetes, and pods certainly reside in the core API group. And we're going to give for an operator um, access to these actions on those uh, resources. So once the operator has sufficient permissions to do its job, we can create the Kubevert custom resource. It's a rather simple manifest, um, which just creates a resource of type Kubevert <clears throat> and uses the Kubevert IO API group and version number specified in the custom resource definition. The operator watches 
uh, custom resources of kind Qbert, and when one appears or changes, it reacts to that. And in the case of creating one, the reaction is de to deploy the Qbert application. The operator will orchestrate all the work to do, and we can just sit back and relax and enjoy our favorite beverage while the thing goes about its business. <clears throat> so the deployment <clears throat> progress of the operator can be monitored by looking at the pods in the Qbert namespace. This uh, slide shows the, the service completely deployed. Uh, you'll notice there's a couple of vert.operator instances running. Uh, again, that's because it was the vert operator is the deployment, which is a wrapper, a controller for replica sets. And we said we wanted two replicas of this thing. The same is true for vert API and vert controller. Vert handler is a daemon set. And a daemon set in Kubernetes is a a resource that tries to maintain a copy of a pod on all nodes in a cluster. And this test cluster had two nodes, which is why we see a couple of vert handler instances here. Better move fast, five minutes. Um, and once deployed, we could take a look at all the Kubert custom resources that are available. <clears throat> and many of these we've mentioned, uh, the presets, provides templates essentially replica sets is a virtual machine instance uh, analogy or comparison to uh, pod replica sets updating qvert is just as easy as deploying it uh, tweak the man the operator manifest maybe add some new sha sum uh, to a new image and deploy it and set back again relax and enjoy your favorite beverage why the operator goes about updating Kubert. Um, <clears throat> and deployment made easy. Even though it's cool to know the manual steps for deploying Kubert, most of the Kubernetes hipsters are deploying apps using a, a Kubernetes package managers, managers such as Helm. And this is roughly analogous to a traditional package manager like RPM. Uh, the Rancher Harvester project actually has some um, Helm charge for Kubert. It'll be interesting to start working with those folks once the merger is complete. <clears throat> so, on to the summit of uh, running VMs. We better get there quickly. Uh, it's been a unnecessarily long journey. <clears throat> and to do that, we use the Kubert API extensions provided by the custom resources and custom controllers. And since we're just using the API, we can use a client like Kube Control to deploy these things. Now, there's also Vert Control, which we'll say a few words about it in a minute. So we need a few things to run a VM. We need a disk image and a specification that defines the VM. And Kubert supports many ways to provide a disk image. We could have a whole talk on that, actually. We use a dev-friendly host disk config and we use containerized data importer to import a disk image uh, to be used by a virtual machine as a persistent volume claim. Um, <clears throat> and of course, for the VM specification, we use a VMI or VM uh, custom resource. And here's an example of a VMI custom resource. Uh, it's a type virtual machine instance. Again, the Kubert IO and version API group. Uh, and in this case, we would, with this manifest, spin up a VM named SLES 15 SP2 with 16 cores and 32 gigabytes of memory. So what happens when you actually, um, <clears throat> you know, post such a manifest to the, <clears throat> To the cluster. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> first, the, K, the Kubernetes API server receives and authenticates this and forwards it to Vert API to validate and create the resource. Vert controller sees this new resource and instructs Kubernetes to create a new pod for running Vert Launcher. Um, Kubernetes will schedule that pod on the node. Vert controller will see that and update the node name field and the VMI resource. Vert handler, which is watching for VMI resources, sees that uh, this resource has been assigned to its node and then goes about configuring Vert launcher for running the VM. Uh, Vert 
handler can do some node centric stuff like setting up storage and networking um, and configuring the VM to run or configuring the launcher to run the VM. It also takes the VMI spec, converts it to live root domain XML and shoves that into the launcher to define the VM. And when it's ready to start, tells the launcher to start the VM. Got to move fast. <clears throat> So VMs since, and VMI, since they're just another custom resource, can be managed like any others using kind of the standard cube control commands. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, these will look familiar. And this slide just shows some of the commands poking at various uh, cubevert pods. <clears throat> so <clears throat> although KubeVirt provides these custom resources that can be managed like any other resource in Kubernetes. VMs are a little bit different than pods, right? They are stateful. They have serial consoles. They have VNCs, and they can be migrated. A pod, if uh, a node needs maintenance, a pod, the typical action to do is to kill it and start it on another node. A VM, we need to live migrate that thing off the node to another before we can do maintenance. So there are differences. And to accommodate that, there's the vert control client. Uh, it can control VM sta states, uh, start and stop and migrate, pause, unpause, and so on. Uh, provides streams for accessing the serial console and VNC, and provides a little bit of syntax sugar on top of the cube control command. I mean, here's an example of starting a VM using cube control versus vert control. There's also a cube control plugin for cube vert, but we haven't really investigated that much, and I really don't know so much about it. And like any journey, um, there's going to be bumps and obstacles along the way, and <clears throat> this one was no uh, no exception. And here's some items that we found helpful while debugging. Um, one that's certainly, well, all of these are helpful, but an interesting one, if you're not knowing about it, is, you know, say you actually have a pod running, but there's some problem in your service, you can gain a shell to that and then poke around inside the shell or in the pod and uh, make sure its environment's set up correctly, your services is installed properly and so on. So just a few words about KubeVirt. Um, and, and the status of the thing. Um, it's been in development for quite a while, actually. The initial commit was in August 2016. And although it's not as mature as LibVirt, it still supports quite a few uh, features, some of which I mentioned here. And the entire KubeVirt API, both all the type definitions and the operations you can perform on those are um, all described at, at the link here. Um, in retrospect, we have this little map of our journey on in the proceedings talk, but um, <clears throat> our path to the summit wasn't always the most straight and direct. We certainly ran in circles quite a bit and so on. And in hindsight, we'd have probably been best to learn a little bit more about Kubernetes at the beginning of this. And you know, maybe then our path would have been a little more direct to the summit instead of this crazy journey that we took. Um, oh, yeah, reminder, last year's talk, which is open source brewing. Um, time for a beer for those of you in Europe, I suppose, now that the end of the day is near. And with that, uh, I'm done. Used quite a bit of time, hopefully. Um, there's some few minutes to answer any questions folks have. <clears throat> I, mean, I certainly know this is an awful lot of material. Um, to go over in 45 minutes and <clears throat> so one question in the chat. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so Lewis question is vertlet then tied to KVM QMU? What about Zen or VirtualBox? Uh, vertlet is tied to QMU KVM. Um, <clears throat> as is Kubert, actually. Um, neither of these projects support Zen, VirtualBox, um, any other virtualizers, open source ones. And Andreas, Jim, can you comment on what use cases we have in mind for Kubert as opposed to pure KVM versus pure uh, Kubernetes? <clears throat> um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, the primary use case that I'm aware of is, you know, folks wanting to bring difficult or costly to containerize virtualized workloads. So virtualized workloads are either too costly, too time consuming, difficult to virtualize, bringing them along into this new world of Kubernetes. Um, and that's kind of the main use case that we've tailored our work around. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, others, hopefully, folks will come to those with us. I guess I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it beyond that basic and obvious use case. So I was thinking mainly into the direction of, um, is this intended to be like, you know, like one very, you know, um, pet style VM being integrated into an otherwise, let's say, landscape of containers interacting with it? Or is the idea to use um, overcommit for you know CPUs and memory to um, have something that actually scales similar to how containers scale? Yeah, um, I mean we should be able to scale these things like container scales using the concept of virtual machine instance replica set. Right, that's kind of the mechanisms that is used for pod scaling. This is provided in KubeVirt via the VMI replica set. So that use case would be supported also. Um, I don't see any. Am I missing some questions in the chat? I think there are no more questions in the chat. Yeah, so them all. we um, have rather we have run out of time, which isn't such a big issue as this is the last talk. So, but if there are no further questions, thank you, Jim, for your talk, and I yeah, stop the recording. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for joining.